and letting people in. Welcome everybody. Welcome everybody to our webinar. Great to have you all here. And um, if you could mute yourselves, if you're not already muted, so we don't pick up all the background noise, that's great. And um, feel free to put your video on. It's nice to see faces. One of the tips of a virtual meeting. Nice to have that connection. And we're gonna get started. So if you are here for the, oop, there's a little echo, I'm gonna mute. I'm also gonna act, actively mute people. So it's not personal. Um, if, if I hear a noise, okay, great. So um, if you're here for the for effective collaborative remote meetings and you're in the right place. And I'm excited to be here with you all today to discuss the joys of collaborative meetings and webinars. And maybe we'll see some of those things that we giggle about um, come up for this session for us. And, but first off, I'll just tell you a little bit about our work and introduce myself and hear from you all. So I'm Rebecca, I'm the communications wizard here at Round Sky. And Round Sky Solutions is a worker-owned cooperative that works with leaders, as, oopsies, aspiring leaders and organizations that value and want to improve their democratic and collaborative processes in their teams, and then also at the same time honing in on their leadership potential. And we do that through courses, coaching, and team or company-based trainings grounded in our collaborative operating system and processes, which we call CoLab, which you'll hear a bit about more throughout this webinar. And we've worked with many people and teams that are navigating how to effectively meet and align across the distance, whether it's across town, across the country, across the globe, um, and that so we've worked with a lot of teams that are having this, this opportunity or challenge. And so we're excited to share with you what we've learned. So first off, before we get too far to orient everyone. So if you have any questions or you want to answer our questions, you can use the chat box and that should be on the, the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. There's a little bubble and you can chat with one person specifically or everyone. So if you have a question just for me, you can go to the drop down menu and look for Rebecca at Round Sky. And then this recording will be recorded or this webinar will be recorded. So just so you know, and shared along with the resources after this meeting. And in general, like I said earlier, for those just jumping on, try to keep yourself on mute unless you're asking, unless it's a Q and A session uh, so we can focus on the speakers. And at the end, we'll have time for questions and answers. Great. So first off, we want to hear about who is on this call. If you could share in that chat box, um, I'll test it out for you. Your name, uh, which place you're calling from today, your city or, or country, and what brought you into this webinar? What, what's the first thing on your mind? So I'll go ahead and put that in here. Oh, um, David, you, you're not getting any sound. Oh, you can hear me now? Great. I see your thumbs up. So go ahead and put your name. I'll go ahead and put mine. And then I'll read a few off. So go ahead and introduce yourselves and feel free to share, um, say hello to each other. Okay, so we have let me just start. Oh, you sure you can do it on the speaker if you like. Some folks are doing it by the chat box, but go go ahead. Well, yep, I'm David Crump. I'm with the uh, Farmers Association in Florida, and uh, someone sent me the link to this that looked interesting. We're we're in five nations, so trying to get everybody keep everyone connected is important. So yeah, thanks. Thanks. Welcome. Glad to have you here. And there are some folks from the Boston area. Um, Tamara or Tamara wanting to improve remote work meetings. We have Juliana in Portland, Maine, Kelly in Hopskinville, Kentucky, learning how to work remotely. 
um, Paulina from Poland, some folks from all over the world. That's amazing. Um, so welcome. And like I said earlier, feel free to introduce yourselves and say hello to each other and um, use that use that space. So I'll tell you a little bit about myself as well. So like I said earlier, I'm Rebecca, the communications wizard at Brown Sky. And I've been working with these awesome folks for about two years this summer. And what brought me to this work is the importance of process and structure to get us where we want to be, um, feeling the intense lack thereof in the other places that I've been, spaces that I've been working in. And I also wanted to enter more fully into the work or co-op movements. So I know there are lots of folks from the worker co-op movement on this call. And I wanted to gain a better understanding of what economic justice looks like for me as I come from a fragmented class background. And I currently live and have been in New Orleans for about five years, originally from California. And um, outside of Brown Sky, I do anti-racist organizing with a collective here, play volleyball, and visit my folks in California. And I'm excited to be here a part this conversation because I've, like I said earlier, experienced some pretty awful and even comical virtual meetings and also some inspiring ones. So I'm um, glad to share what we've come up with. So I'll pass this off to Cecile. Yeah, thanks, Rebecca. And thanks, everyone. I'm Cecile, one of the co-founders of Round Sky Solutions, and I live near Montpelier, Vermont. I've been a social entrepreneur for 30 years and have experienced a lot of challenging organizational dynamics, including frustrating meetings, both virtual and in person. And motivated by the waste of time, energy, and creativity that an effective organizational meeting culture represents, I was inspired to take up a deep dive into organizational and individual development in a search for an answer. In particular, I was curious what power is and developed some theories about power to map or explain the dynamics I commonly saw in organizations. I synthesized this research um, with my career experiences and from that research, I created a map of what organizations need to communicate about and a set of processes called CoLab that reliably deliver healthy forms of power in action, including much more fun, engaging and productive virtual meetings. I published Collaboration That Works, a ruthlessly practical handbook for a generative world as a training manual that summarizes this research and introduces collab for organizations. So I'm delighted to be here with you today ex actively exploring ways of transcending frustrating meeting culture. And today we're gonna start by looking at why effective collaborative virtual meetings are so important, followed up by an introduction to four hacks for getting collaborative efficiency in your virtual meetings. And after today's webinar, we'll be sending you templates and flowcharts that you can use in your meetings. We'll wrap up with some next steps you can consider for yourself and a Q&A. So I'll pass it back to Rebecca. Um, yeah, off to you. Great, thanks, Cecile. So first, we kind of got at this a little bit earlier, but just curious about what, um, how have you experienced virtual meetings thus far? What's bringing you here today? What um, either funny stories, maybe frustrating stories. And while you do that in the chat box, so we can just get a sense of where people are at, uh, I'll share, I'll just share a little thought for me. Um, so I, some of you may have seen the conference call bingo meme that was going around, around social media. Um, so that I think uh, if I had used that a couple of years back, I would have had a, a full bingo, full blackout bingo there. So that's kind of funny and um, a little, a little fun, fun note about that. So please do share your, your experiences here. Um, Greg is here saying that they work from home, free software consultant, almost every meeting you have is virtual. I'd love to hear about what your experience is in that. Um, someone is, Becca is sharing, um, I've experienced some confusion and some synergy using collab tools and even some intimate sharing, which was really great. Hmm. That is. The moment when you meet someone after you've been on a call with them for a year and haven't met them in real life is kind of um, surreal. We, Diane says, we have a few remote staff and it's difficult to carve out uh, 
the time to develop deep relationships, share best practices as they come up and remain connected on a more daily basis. Mm. Monthly corporate conference calls that last three hours. Whew. Now working for different, a different group and we use Google Hangouts uh, for weekly meetings. Having video keeps people more involved and keeping it to an hour helps, absolutely. So keep sharing and as you do that, um, Cecile, I'll pass it back to Cecile to talk about some common challenges. Yeah, thanks everyone. You know, many of us have experienced frustrating or even terrible virtual meetings. Uh, thank you all for your examples just now. And to name just a top few from my experience, you can get, often get people talking over each other, resulting in no one being able to hear. One person's tech issues can derail everyone's participation. Uh, people getting offended and defensive, even if it's subtle, and this reveals underlying difficulties that can get in the way of doing good work together. People being accusatory and snide, even if it's not subtle, disagreements can come out more directly, which further undermines our ability to work together. People disengaging, both during the virtual meetings, you know, multitasking, doing other things, um, but then even also that extends outside of meetings. Our meeting culture spills over into every part of our work life. And if you've got a bad meeting culture, you can expect disengagement on some level or another. Updates that go on forever and are not helpful. So short, succinct, and relevant updates for our teammates are essential to doing good work in sync with each other. And uh, we also have a few more examples here. A few people who have too much responsibility can lead to any number of workplace dysfunctions. Only a few people doing all the talking, uh, which further imbalances perspectives and investment. And well-intentioned people delivering inconsistent accountability. If people are taking on projects and then forgetting about them or not making any progress, the sense of floundering as a team increases. Uh, another challenge, agenda items that only reflect the needs of a few. Uh, most meeting cultures preference the manager or the team lead's perspectives. And while a team lead might have more on their mind, not requesting input from all team members as we build the agenda leads to lost opportunities for the team and improvement. Also agenda items that take way too long and don't lead to meaningful items that move things forward. And another very common mistake, which is difficult to surmount even with, within an effective process that the whole team knows and understands. Um, so we also have meetings with no clear ending that drag on for hours and uh, the list goes on. I'm sure you all have a few other experiences um, on your list. So let's take just a minute to talk about the consequences. Uh, since ineffective meeting culture is so endemic, it's easy to think that it's normal or unavoidable. And I'm here to tell you today that while it may be normal, meaning that it happens all the time in all kinds of organizations, it's not healthy and it is entirely avoidable. The problem with accepting bad meeting culture is that it saps organizational energy and focus. Um, there's nothing like an argument in the middle of a meeting for making everything worse. It also wastes time. Uh, virtual meetings uh, are one of the most efficient ways to sync up and align. And when they are wasted with no clear decisions or next actions, people still have to obtain that information or risk doing useless work. And then they have to do that work of obtaining that information outside of meetings, and that represents a double waste of time. So also the sense of being stuck can increase if you have a bad meeting culture. It leaves people feeling powerless and frustrated, leading to disengagement. And it underscores the sense of being overworked and underappreciated when we don't have good mechanisms for redistributing work because we can't really see what other people are doing or not doing. Um, it's also easy for, for us to feel unappreciated and unseen for our work. It also makes it much harder to address the actual important issues and get good work done together. So when virtual meetings are wasted on conversations that go on way past the point of usefulness for the organization, the time we have to discuss and decide on important issues dwindles. So let's turn our attention to the suggestions we have for you today, some of those hacks that lead to effective meetings. And just a quick note for you that all of these hacks integrate with platforms out there like Asana, Lumio, Slack. It basically operates underneath those platforms, operating um, in a way to support the overall meeting culture. 
So they don't, these hacks do not replace the platforms that you're using them on. All right, so off to the first hack, hack number one. Uh, this is one of my favorites. It's called the living agenda. And today we're gonna show you four hacks out of dozens that we've researched and synthesized into the collaborative operating system we call CoLab. And these are the top four that we recommend getting started with. Uh, there are lots of other ones, but we think these are the easiest place to start. Uh, however, implementing in organizations can be a tricky affair, so we recommend you consider further training and support during this transformation. So as I mentioned, uh, one of the simplest, easiest places to start is with a doc we call the Living Agenda. And this is simply a Google Doc shared with all members of the team and used as a visual reference during the meeting. Um, by all team members, so we're all looking at the same doc. And as the doc name suggests, it becomes a repository of your meeting outcomes with one date stacked upon the next, with the most recent at the top. As a Google Doc, it's searchable and available to all team members in real time. And one of the benefits of having a real-time visual reference is that we all get to see the outcomes being recorded. This makes it much more clear that we are not moving on from one item to the next until we've recorded a clear decision or next action. Those decisions and next actions can be color-coded for ease of reference. And the, the simple use of this doc can keep your conversations focused and targeted on outcomes. It also means that one person can't just derail a conversation that's underway because the expectation is that we complete one item, including recording the outcomes that everyone can see and consent on before we move on to the next. So we've developed a template uh, for you to use as a living agenda and we'll be sending that out in the follow up email. Uh, feel free to make a copy of it and use it in your next team meeting. We recommend that you use the template for the practice and for the meeting practice and copy and paste that down for each instance of a meeting changing the title to reflect the date okay so uh, your next action with this one is to create and use a living agenda for all of your vir virtual meetings it's a, a simple and easy way of getting more alignment between us during meetings and more clarity okay off to the hack number two Another uh, benefit of the living agenda is that it offers a template for your meeting practice that standardizes how virtual meetings are held. There's a lot of information that goes into each of the steps of what we call the standard meeting practice, which you can learn more about in our trainings. But the key here is having a repeatable process for your virtual meetings that is clear, fair, and transparent. This streamlines people's expectations for virtual meetings, making it much easier to participate in a generative way. In addition, our research and testing has shown that virtual meetings flow much more easily when there's an elected facilitator whose job it is to take us through the steps of the meeting process and an elected scribe whose job it is to record the clear outcomes of the agenda items in the living agenda where everyone can see them. When you elect your facilitator, and your scribe, keep in mind that it's much better not to have the manager or the lead of your team be the facilitator, and here's why. Uh, the manager or team lead already usually has a lot of power, and so, does a, facilit and so a, a facilitator also does that, and combining the two uh, centers of power in one person often results in virtual meetings being skewed to represent that one person's perspective and their desires. So this leads to disengagement and lack of incremental improvement outside of that one person's ideas. So I mentioned a scribe as well, and their role is vital because of how information is recorded and therefore remembered, it's, it also is a locus of power. Um, so information is power, that's a very real thing. And having one elected scribe also means that we know whose job it is to write on the living agenda. Having many scribes in a meeting is an invitation to confusion, argument, and frustration. So one person in charge of these details with maybe a backup scribe who steps in if they've been asked. And you give them the power to step in and request a clear outcome of an agenda item before moving on to the next if that's needed. So on this particular hack, your next action is to use a consistent meeting practice such as CoLab standard meeting practice with an elected scribe and facilitator. Okay, off to hack number three. 
The third hack that we want to share with you is the power of a clear, efficient, and effective collaborative decision-making process. So, so many issues can be solved when we know how to make decisions and when it's clear to everyone and fair so all can participate and efficient so we can make decisions together rapidly rather than having them drag on interminably. The other benefit to a clear collaborative decision-making process is that it distributes power to all team, all the members of a team, rather than having just one person, often the manager, making all the decisions. So we'd like to offer you the model for collaborative decision-making that we use called Integrative Consent. We'll be sending out a flowchart for it in our follow-up email, and we hope you give it a try. One of the secret ingredients in making Integrative Consent work we'll be talking about in our fourth hack, and so your next action here with, uh, with hack number three is to use integrative consent or another clear, effective, collaborative decision-making process that everyone on your team understands and their voice is heard during the process. Okay, after our fourth hack, one tension holder per tension. Um, in order to introduce you to this hack, I need to share what we mean by tension in this context. And so briefly, we use the term tension to indicate any difference between where we are as a team today and where we could be. This could be just a better idea for how to do something or an issue that's getting in the way of good work being done. So the term is not just negative, um, it's also fundamentally positive because we're inviting all teammates to sense into what's in their way of doing better work and bring that to the meeting agenda. We recommend that you build your agenda from the tensions of everyone present, not just the manager or lead. When you allocate building the agenda to one or a few, the opportunity to harness the collective intelligence of your team is lost. Even if you, as the agenda builder, go around to ask people before the meeting what's on their mind. Um, so this is a subtle shift and it can be profound and it can take weeks to months of practice to produce the engagement, but it will do so. So building your meeting agenda from the tensions of all present and then inviting team members to vote on those tensions according to which ones they feel are the most important to this particular meeting is an effective way of getting uh, additional engagement and clarity. In addition, as these agenda items are placed on the agenda, have the person raising that tension put their initials on this item. This is critical because that person becomes the tension holder for that item, which means they carry a special role during the processing of that agenda item. And their job is to identify the outcomes that will incrementally move their tension forward. So in other words, it's not up to just the manager or lead or anyone else on the team to decide how, what outcomes will work for now. That decision belongs to the tension holder, the person whose agenda item it is. And so for example, and to reference hack number three, the integrative consent, when an item requires a decision, that tension holder is responsible for crafting a proposal for the decision and, and making amendments to it prior to the objection round. This is hugely streamlining and simplifying. If we don't have a tension holder who has this kind of responsibility in a meeting, items can drag on for much, much longer than is necessary or helpful. So your next action on this one is to build your agenda from all of the teammates and ask them to be tension holders for their item. So let's take just a couple of minutes now that we've gone over the hacks to talk about what are some of the benefits that you can expect from these. Uh, getting to effective collaborative virtual meetings can be challenging, but it's well worth the effort. So imagine for a moment what it might be like for you to have an organization full of inspiring leaders with tools that enable you to hack your meetings into flows and effective outcomes. Well, for one thing, improving your virtual meetings will save you time and energy and open up space for everyone on the team to be more of their full selves, which simply feels better and frankly gets better results. You can look forward to some of the following things, engaging in efficient collaboratively led virtual meetings. The power and joy and fulfillment that comes from productive, efficient virtual meetings goes on to infuse all of the work that we do with that same motivating force, bringing much more meaning and productivity to everything that we do together. Working together productively um, with flow and satisfaction. Yeah, working in collaboration with others can be 
profoundly frustrating. And that frustration is simply a drain on both organization and individual. So getting to a flow and satisfaction produces a host of benefits, including longevity. In other words, people sticking around to contribute to an organization's success. Another benefit is not getting stuck on issues. Uh, the feeling of being stuck in one's work with others is corrosive, especially if it's a consistent feature of your meetings. Being able to move forward even on difficult issues is like opening the windows in a stale room and letting the light and air in. It feels so much better. You also get better innovation and problem solving. So yeah, working together is all about facing challenges and surmounting them together. Being equipped to do so not only efficiently, but also with creativity and innovation is critical to organizational success in the complex and constantly changing business environment that we all find ourselves in today. Another benefit, mutual support and accountability. Uh, one of the biggest challenges of collaborative work environments where we are explicitly sharing power is how do we get accountability? Both how do we support each other in getting our work done and how do we hold each other accountable in the process? Also, another benefit is a real distribution of power and voice. Uh, this one is huge. If you really want to get innovating and feel some meaningful engagement from your team, try giving them real power. And last but not least, meaningful and satisfying participation. And the best part I think about learning all of this is that you are going to be able to use these skills over and over again in all kinds of different contexts. It's like you'll have cracked the collaboration code and have superpowers for enabling people to get along and do better work together. So let's take just a moment to summarize these, summarize these hacks for you all. And remember, we'll have a Q&A in just a little bit. So keep, keep track of your questions. You can enter them in the chat box now if you'd like. But uh, in short, hack number one, create and use a living agenda. So Google Doc that everyone can see. Use those in your meetings. Hack number two, use the standard meeting process and elect a scribe and facilitator. Hack number three, use integrative consent or another clear, effective, collaborative decision-making process. And number four, build your agenda from all present and ask them to act as tension holders when it's their item. So hopefully you can see that it's much, it is fairly easy to get uh, engage in collaborative virtual meetings that don't suck when you know what it goes into it. And we'd like to take a moment to tell you about an opportunity to learn how to do this through our level one collaborative leadership certification program. And I'm gonna pass it to Rebecca, who's gonna share just a little bit about the program with you before we dive into the Q&A. Thanks, Cecile. And um, as, Cecile mentioned, feel free to write your questions down in the, Q in the chat box so uh, we have them for the Q&A if you, if you have them top of mind right now. Uh, that's totally acceptable. And so what I want to do is we will be sending these templates and the PowerPoint out to you all and the summary of these hacks. And there's a way that you can engage in our level one training just to take this a step further if that's something that you'd like to do. So these will certainly help you as, as you start implementing this in the next month. And then there's an option to go a little bit deeper as you, um, as you wish. So that option is our level one training in collaborative leadership. And it's a 10 week remote learning program for leaders within organizations or teams, coaches, consultants, and other visionaries seeking to put the tools for um, democratic leadership and management into action even across the distance. And at the same time, it, it builds up leadership that's generative rather than dominating. And so I like to think of this training as having two different tracks. So one of them is these management tools that you've learned today along with many others. And then also a real focus on leadership development for yourself and how to re-implement that in your team. And so over the 10 sessions, we focused on these collaborative and remote management practices. And that includes how to to be an effective facilitator, how to effectively scribe because information is power and it should be intentional. And also discussing how to nurture accountability through individual and pr collective project tracking and mapping out the roles in your team so that um, you can name leadership, which is engaging for a virtual environment and also gives people healthy power over their work. 
so that not everything has to be consent. I think someone mentioned that um, in their challenges that they've experienced in virtual meetings earlier. And then we dive into this decision making model. So answering questions like who should make which decisions and when the collective needs to make a decision. And there are many, um, I'll share the main ongoing projects with you so you could decide if this is something you'd like to integrate um, for, your, for yourself as you're looking for solutions to your problems. And so the main projects are personal development topic area or area of growth. And you'll be asked to come up with a personal development topic to support your learning um, during the training. And then you'll have a personal task tracking project, which you'll be introduced to the tools you need for your own personal and time and task management system. And with that information, you'll also upgrade um, your collectives task tracking system together. So how to, over across the distance, how do you know what people are working on? This is one of the answers to that. And then you'll have your scopes and roles project, which is mapping out who's, who, who's in charge of what works. So who do you go to when you have a question? And um, really answering that, naming that leadership and answering that accountability question, how to get accountability. And then um, introducing this to your, how to introduce this to your team and onboard your team. So a plan of implementation basically. And so I'll just sum that up with, if you'd like to learn more and dive a bit deeper, you can go to our website, uh, roundskysolutions.com slash CLCP1. And we're holding a free info call in two weeks on June 13th. So you'll, you can learn more about the program there and hear from past and current students. So to be a part of this summer cohort. So we'd love to have you all there. Um, if, any, if you have any questions about that or about any of the content from this webinar, uh, please put them in the chat box. And since there's a few, quite a few of us on the call, we'll use the chat box unless we need to um, ask further questions. So let's, let's jump into there and I'll see what folks have been chatting here. Oh, thanks for joining us. Every, oh, thank you for the, the thank yous in here um, and we did have a question before this before the webinar posted in uh, registration about how to use platforms like Lumio and Slack and Asana and how to make them work with some of these hacks so I'll just offer that up to you Cecile to answer if that person is on this call or if other people are curious yeah absolutely um, great question so for those of you who aren't familiar with Lumio, it is a consensus-based decision-making platform and it works asynchronously. So you're able to sort of post um, proposals and, and you know, vote on them and whatnot. And uh, Lumio integrates with the hacks we've just uh, provided for you in the sense that it offers that decision-making uh, structure for you in an asynchronous you know, way. So you don't have to be either meeting um, virtually or, or in person in order to, to move decisions along. The key to making it work though is to uh, having really clear expectations with your team about what timelines are in terms of responses. Um, one of the challenges I've seen is that when using Lumio, you can get very, very low engagement with it. Um, and so I find that it's insufficient as a tool to just replace your meetings. Um, if you want that actual participation from people. And um, so, yeah, uh, 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 more clarity around how to use the platform is usually required in order for it to work for a team. That's Lumio. Slack um, is a communication tool, a lot like Skype. Um, and, and that channel can, that also works as a platform. What I, what I find is a similar, you need to have really clear agreements with your team on what constitutes a new thread. Otherwise you get this hundreds of threads and it's, uh, virtually impossible to to make it work for you, for a team past a past a certain point. So, um, that uh, uh, that's a, that's Slack and Asana is a project management platform, which is a great way to track your projects and have that be uh, transparent and visible across distance. And we highly recommend some system to uh, maintain transparency on projects for every member of a team. Uh, but again, the underlying agreements by which you use those platforms are uh, just as important, if not more important than the platforms themselves. And so that's, um, that's what we're really pointing to here with Collab is, you know, what are our agreements for, uh, you know, tracking our projects or communicating asynchronously? Um, those uh, need some kind of decision making process to get clear on them and, and uh, a practice for revisiting them as needed. Great question. 
Thanks, Cecile. And there's another question here. In, re um, in remote meetings, I as a facilitator sometimes struggle with the fact that I'm getting truncated body language and other ambient cues mm -hmm. that are important to managing contentious or high stakes decision processes. Thoughts on how to handle that? Yes, that's yes, that's great. Thank you. Um, yes, so the body language is, is harder, especially if you're not using visual um, video, you know, video feed as well. So I recommend trying to get some video feed that will help you, but even with that, you're still gonna miss some information. So there's a couple of suggestions here for you. Um, the, the first is that having a, uh, a clear uh, decision-making process that everyone understands will make navigating um, difficult decisions, contentious decisions, much, much, much easier. The problem with contentious environments is that people tend to fly off and do whatever they want in terms of how they communicate, and that's often unhelpful, right? And so having clear boundaries around what type of information we're asking you for during this part of our decision-making process helps to channel that contention into something uh, creative and innovative rather than having it be just frustrating and difficult for the team. So that process is, is super critical um, for managing contentious environments or decisions rather. And the third thing I'd mention is that um, as, uh, as a leader, uh, we have this ability to tap into our physical bodies as a, a place to sense what is going on with our team. And what I found is that when that somatic capacity, that ability to notice what's going on in my own body as a, as a tuning fork or as a litmus test, when I've developed that, I, it works in virtual environments as well as non-virtual environments. So um, it's, a, it's a really uh, effective tool for sort of expanding your ability to sense what's going on uh, in a team. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Cecile. And Kate, if you have a follow-up question, please, please share. Um, we have plenty of time here, so if other people have questions or want to troubleshoot something that's happening in your, your team, um, in your virtual meetings, or in your meetings in general that you want to share out, um, this is a great place to do that, maybe that we didn't cover today. And that's okay if not. And some folks are sharing um, other resources in the chat box. Feel free to check those out. Um, great. So I'll just give us a few more seconds to build any other questions or surface any other questions that are coming up for people before we say our goodbyes. Okay, there's another question here. Um, Sarah asks, we work with people that have very different tech capacity, um, like poor broadband connection. Is it better to avoid if everyone can't connect in the same way? Hmm. If, if you are unable to actually connect in the same way, it, is, it, is, um, it represents a, a division essentially in your um, in your communications and your ability to share power together as a team. And so, yes, if, if um, you want to hold virtual meetings, it is essential that you make access possible for every member of your team. And it could be a different platform. Um, maybe it's phone instead of uh, something like Zoom or Google Hangouts or Skype. Um, that doesn't perhaps require quite as much bandwidth. Um, I would also mention that if, if um, bandwidth is an issue that you can use voice as opposed to vi voice and video. Video consumes a lot of bandwidth. Um, so often if I'm in the middle of a meeting and someone's audio is coming and going, we'll just, we'll cut video. We'll cut video for the whole team. And that means that that person usually is able to come back and, and participate. So it's, it's a little hack I've learned along the way um, that can be really helpful. Um, yeah, being strategic about when, when um, you're using more broadband, maybe during check-in so you can see each other's faces and mm -hmm. then for the other things, or maybe for that contentious decision, you're like, let's try to put video on, see if we can have yeah. enough. That makes sense. And we have some other questions here. 
uh, some great questions. One, uh, the next one is, let's see, lots of movements. Any suggestions for convincing folks to use these online tech options like Slack for those that are resistant? Or maybe even making changes in general to a new new way of working. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll just you know name for myself. Like adjusting to a new platform is is hard. All, most of us are are tapped out. Right? We've got way too much on our plates, and learning something new is is hard. It's hard. Period. It's it actually, uh, you know, science shows that it creates you know some experience of pain in our brain and our bodies to to actually go and learn something new. So I think it's important to acknowledge that to name that up front that learning something new is going to take some effort and it may not be comfortable um, and that expectation helps. Um, but um, that's not, don't recommend stopping there. I think that uh, if you really want to integrate the use of a new platform, it's critical that it be used during your meetings because meetings are a place to practice and it's a place to acclimate people to a new tool and to see how other people are using it and to get ideas from it and support and the accountability back. Like, have you actually gone and done X, Y, or Z in the platform yet? And when you have to show up in a meeting and say no or yes, it drives more engagement from people if they know they have to come back and actually use that platform in front of everyone else. So that's, that's a really effective way of getting it. And if you pair that with some patience and the opportunity to get more training, um, more support, uh, sometimes a buddy system is really helpful, pair people who are good at it with folks who are not and have them do, you know, do some, um, some trainings together one-on-one. -on -one. Those are a few suggestions, but um, I also have found that just saying, oh, we're gonna do this new thing, um, even if you all agree to it ahead of time, uh, the, the, the results are often very patchy unless it's baked in, ba baked back in in that accountability loop and it's actually used when you are all using it together. That's a great suggestion. And if you have a follow-up question, please, please share. And another question for you, Cecile. What if we're not really ready for full self-management? Can these still work? Yes, absolutely. Um, and in fact, these tools really, um, the tools in particular that we just, the hacks we introduced to you today um, from Collab are especially effective at building the capacity for self-management. Um, and that, that often needs to proceed the just use of a platform. Um, you kind of have to have both. You have to have the, the, you know, the process understanding and tools in order to make these platforms serve you. And starting inc incrementally is, is perfect. I recommend you start with that, that living agenda and the standard meeting practice. It's a really useful way to sort of begin to onboard people um, into this idea of self-management. And Becca, if you have a follow-up about something specific that's happening for your team or where you're at, feel free to share. Yeah, actually I do. So I'm in, I'm in a new job that doesn't, um, that doesn't have, that really wants more efficiency and I'm having a hard time introducing this as a non-CEO. The CEO was really amenable. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just really challenging to kind of say like, sure. And, and I know Colab a lot better than she would. So there's a little bit of that kind of rank and there's a little bit of the kind of reverse power dynamic. where like, I know how to do this. Um, so yeah, I'm just feeling like I, I wanted a way to introduce it as a non, um, uh, person at the top in a, in a group that, that is somewhat non hierarchical. And yet I'm literally two weeks new into the job. So um, do you have any ideas about that also? Yes, yeah. Well, um, the, the process that I find helpful is to um, pick, pick something, one thing, maybe it's the decision-making process, maybe it's the living agenda, and ask if, if it would be okay with the team to give it a, a try, to do an experiment, try it for a couple of meetings or something, um, and see what the benefits are. Uh, to to your team. Uh, the other piece of that I think is having a really good handle on what are the challenges that you think using these tools will help with. Uh, because as part of your proposal you can say well 
I found this to work really well for these particular kinds of problems that we're having. Would you all be interested in doing a little experiment with me for a couple of weeks? We'll see how it goes. And um, as long as you can get at least minimal consent to that, then go ahead and, and, and do it. And then make sure that you do check back with the team at the, in, the, in the time frame that you suggested. Get feedback from folks and, and see where it goes from there. Great, thanks so much. That's a great question, I think. As many of us are maybe not at the top in our organizations, that's, but we want to work in an organization that is kind of um, getting, valuing more flat organizations or exploring that is a big question. I hear a lot. Great, well, so it was, so great to meet with you all. Um, please feel free to reach out to us if other questions bubble up after this. I know learning can sometimes be um, cyclical, is how I like to think about it. So you come back to it, you, maybe you're reading these, the, the next actions and you want to, then a question comes up for you. So please reach out to us. It's great to have you all and I'll send out the recording in the next day. Yep, um, you will definitely get the recording in the next day or so. All right, feel free to open your mics and say goodbye if you'd like. Thank you, thanks, bye. Bye-bye. Thank yeah, thanks Thank a lot. You. Thanks, bye.